How's everyone doing this morning? <laughs> doing all right? Say, hey, my name is Joel, and if uh, you're new today, just want to say welcome to you. So glad that you're here and you're with us today. We're wrapping up a series that we started a few weeks ago, looking at a guy named Jonah, a story that's in the Bible. You maybe have heard of it, maybe read it, maybe played toys that were made of it <laughs> when you were a kid once upon a time. You know, one of the things I, I love when we look at Jonah's story is we see God wanting to work in the lives of people. And I think it's such a beautiful thing when we see that God's desire to work with people and work in people. And, and like that song that we just sang, like when, when Jesus shows up in your life, when Jesus shows up in your story, it changes things. Like, like we step into a future that's bright and secure. We step into a hope that, that God is at work in our story, that Jesus is leading us into something amazing. And so it is well because of him. And that should change things. That, that, that should change how we work and how we interact. And that should change what we're striving to do. It, it should change what we're trying to do in the relationships around us because it's well with us. And when it's well with you, it, it should flow through your life and around your life into the lives of people around you. And yet even though it should, it doesn't always do that, right? Right? Because what about those times when it just doesn't seem to be flowing through your life? Like, like when you're like, I know these things I've learned and these things I've heard about, but uh, maybe not so much today. Like, have you ever felt that? Like, like yeah, honest crowd, I love it. But yeah, like sometimes there just like seems to be a disconnect between us and, and God and what God wants and what we want. And, and man, we see this so much in Jonah's life. We see this disconnect so greatly in his story and and as we come to the final chapter today, the, the last episode of the Jonah special on Netflix, <laughs> we discover some interesting things that have been going on inside of Jonah as the story has been unfolding. And, and if you were here last week, you, you, you saw as Ron was teaching that he, he walked us through Jonah chapter 3, and something incredible happened in Jonah chapter 3. Like God had come to Jonah initially and said, I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to do something really fun, declare my judgment against them. And Jonah's like, I'm out. <laughs> and he runs away from God, and God pursues him because he doesn't want to give up on Jonah. He's got a life for him. And so Jonah's like, I'm out. He jumps ship. He tries to end it. That's how much he doesn't want to be a part of what God's doing. And God's like, Jonah, I'm not giving up on you. Cue the Jaws music. <laughs> and this fish swallows Jonah, saving him. And he wrestles in this fish with God for three days until he finally comes to a point of surrender and saying, okay, God, I know you're good, so okay, let's do this. And the fish belches him onto the sand, and he goes to Nineveh and graciously says, you're going to die. <laughs> and the incredible thing is what we saw in, in chapter 3. It says this, that the people of Nineveh believed God's message from the greatest to the least, and they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. Like They, they, they were like, whoa, God is telling us this, this wicked stuff that we've been doing, and they were doing some bad stuff, like brutalizing the nations around them. They're like, we need to stop. And they respond, and then this was God's response to them at the end of Jonah chapter 3. It says, when God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened which is what God said he would do all along. Like through one of his prophets at another point in the Bible, through this guy Jeremiah, God actually said, hey, if there's a nation that's out there and just doing wicked things, and I come and tell them to stop, and they stop, man, I will I'll embrace them back again. And so this is God just being consistent with what he said he would do if people would respond. And, and so you got to imagine how excited God must be in this moment that they had this change of heart, that, that the city of 120,000 people returned to him like, that's a good day. Like, if you're a Democrat and your Republican friend finally sees the light, like, that's a good day. Or is it the other way around? I'm, I'm still relearning my politics coming back in, and, you know, it's, so, it's such a pleasant conversation. I, I can always see who's right and wrong in it. <laughs> right, but so you can only imagine how excited God must be to share this moment with Jonah. Like, Jonah, this is what I wanted. This is why I called you. I wanted you to go to the city so they would turn back to me. And when you ran from me, this is why I pursued you. And when you jumped ship, this is why I had a fish swallow you. This is why I rescued you. So you could be in this moment with me. High five. We did it. 
And so what's Jonah's response to this? This incredible moment that God just must be so excited about. Chapter 4, verse 1. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah. And he became very angry. And like, wait, what? Like, mission success? Dang it. And like, Jonah, what? what, what? Okay, you know when you discover something you don't like about someone that you thought you liked? Well, here we go with Jonah. So Jonah complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That's why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You're eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not come true. Bro, what is going on? It's like Jonah saying, oh, the nerve. How dare you, God, be so compassionate and kind and loving? Like, who do you think you are? And so Jonah is bent in this moment. And yet what's amazing is Jonah said, God, I knew you would do this. And you know why Jonah knew God would do this? Because he knew who God was. In fact, this is who God revealed himself to be to Jonah and his ancestors. I mean, you go back to the story of one of their founding prophets, this guy named Moses, and, and God shows up and tells Moses his name. And when God says to Moses, let me tell you who I am, I am a compassionate and loving God, slow to anger, abounding in love. And this is what God said his name was. And so Jonah knew this. And so we begin to realize, oh, the reason Jonah ran back in chapter 1 had nothing to do with being afraid of these people. It had nothing to be afraid of a socially awkward moment, like the backlash on Facebook if he says something unpopular. He's not worried about that. No, the, ro- the, reason, the reason Jonah ran is because he's a racist. He's a xenophobic, bitter man. And he doesn't like that God would not bring judgment on these people, these Ninevites. Now, now, I mean, we might be able to sympathize with Jonah, especially if you understand what the Ninevites were like. We've said this several times. The Ninevites were the Nazis of their day. I mean, they were brutalizing the people around them. They were decimating the other people. They were doing horrible, horrible, ugly, despicable things. And, and for all we know, they did some of this to even Jonah's own friends, maybe even his family. So we might be able to sympathize with Jonah in this moment. And yet, despite the darkness of these people, that God's heart, was for their rescue. God's heart was so that they would be found in him, and he wanted to rescue them just as much as he wanted to rescue Jonah. And so God and Jonah start to have a little bit of a conversation. And so the Lord replies to Jonah and says, is it right for you to be angry about this? See what God's doing? He's challenging Jonah about his perspective and, and the attitude of his heart and And Jonah's response to God's question? Well, then Jonah went outside to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under, and he waited to see what would happen to the city. Okay, you know that moment when you realize somebody's really upset with you that they won't even talk to you? That's what's going on here between God and Jonah. God's talking to Jonah, and Jonah's just giving him the cold shoulder, like, I'm just going to go out here and someone burn the city. That's what's going on. I mean, the God of the universe is engaging in a conversation, and Jonah's like, no. (laughs) This is insane to me. I'm like, you are an idiot. What's going on? And yet here's a question. How does God get our attention when we don't want to talk to him? Yeah. What has God got to do so that we'll engage with him? And so this is what God does with Jonah. And the Lord arranged for a leafy plant to grow there. And and soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. And this eased his discomfort. And Jonah was very grateful for the plant. For the plant. Not for God, (laughs) who gave him the plant. It's like, he still can't figure it out. And it's like, Okay, Jonah, time for an object lesson. Let me tell you, it's never really fun when God's like, let's do a little object lesson. 
but this is where it goes. So next, we've got also arranged for a worm. It's never a good day when a worm shows up in your store. <laughs> so the next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. And the sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. He would have been a great actor. And I look at that, I'm like, God, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? It's almost like you're messing with Jonah. Like, have you ever done that with someone? Like, come on, how many of you are older siblings? And you just took a little bit too much pleasure in someone else's discomfort or a little bit too much pleasure in poking someone? Yeah, you know why you do that? You're a borderline sociopath. <laughs> And, and yet, I'm like, God, I don't think that's what you're doing because God's not petty like you or me. So God, what are you doing? So God says to Jonah, again, God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. I mean, he's like a little toddler, like, uh -huh. And yet you see what God's doing in this moment? How he's trying to get his attention? See how God is still choosing to engage with him, even though God could be like, Psh, forget you. And God's like, no, no, Jonah. And see, he's even asking him the same question he asked him just a moment ago. But this time on a much smaller scale. Like, Jonah, I, I was asking why you're upset about me not killing 120,000 people. If that was too big for you to grasp, let's go to the plant. <laughs> Are you upset about a plant, Jonah? Jonah, if you can't see the big picture, then let, let, let's bring it down close. <laughs> and let's see if you can figure out what's going on and not around you, Jonah. Let's see if you can figure out what's going on inside of you. Because something's out of sorts there. And then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness. And it's interesting in the, in the original language that this was written, that word play that we translate in the English here, spiritual darkness, it's, it's this picture of, of somebody who doesn't even know their morality enough to know like, their right hand from their left hand. He's like, they're so confused and messed up, Jonah. They're living in darkness. Not to mention all the animals. Like, God likes animals too. Like, it's not their fault they're with bad people. <laughs> Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? And then the story ends. Like, done. I'm like, what? And I turn the page, like, where's chapter five? Did we lose the manuscript? Like, what, what happened? Like, you go on IMDb, Netflix, is there a season two of Jonah? Like, like, what do you mean it just stops right here and ends? I don't understand. And we're left wondering in this moment, what's Jonah going to do? I mean, is he going to respond or is he just going to stay on the outskirts of Nineveh wallowing in his misery? And yet I wonder if maybe that is the point of the story. Because we're left standing there saying, Jonah, what are you going to do? And it actually causes us to to maybe look at our own lives and ask the question, what would we do if his story was our story? How would we respond? So because how do you respond when God surprises us with his mercy and his love and his kindness and his compassion? And not just when he surprises us by giving it to us. What do we do when he surprises us by giving it to them, whoever they are, to you? To those people that you think, no way, they don't deserve this. Like, how do we respond when God moves in grace and mercy and kindness towards those we cannot stand? What does that reveal about us? And in those moments, what will we sync up with God and and choose to have God's heart towards that person or, or them in the same way that God has that love towards us. Because in this, in this story, like we, we discover something really incredible about God. 
And his heart for people, his heart for all kinds of people, like for people like the Ninevites and for people like Jonah. See, because God wanted to do something through Jonah. He wanted to do something through Jonah, and he wanted to deliver a message to the Ninevites. And, and see, this was their wake-up call. Like God wanted to understand this, this is not good what you're doing. Brutally killing people is not a good thing, and it needs to stop because there's an or else coming. But the good news is, is I'm giving you a warning so you can respond. See, when God brings judgment, it's not meant to be condemnation. It's meant to be wake-up call. The amazing thing, when Jonah delivered the message, it was just the condemnation he was delivering. Yet they still responded. Jonah forgot to say, because God's loving and he's got something better for you. Yet they still understood that. And they responded. And, and see, God is good, which means he's going to deal with things that aren't right in this world, which... It's such a hopeful thought until I realize that means he's also got to deal with me. Because <laughs> I, I know my story, and there's things in my story where I'm like, uh-oh, there's a day coming. Because my hands aren't clean. How about you? And you know what our hope is? Our hope is that God is good. And in his goodness, he desires our rescue. He desires to, to find us as we are and to lead us into the hope of something better. And yet, because God wants us to experience love, I mean, he created us for love. You can't force love on another person. You can only invite them into it. And so God can't force his rescue on us. He can only invite us into it. It's kind of like if you've ever been out swimming in the ocean and a lifeguard has to come and help you. That's a great day, by the way, because <laughs> you are not cool anymore. And I've had some friends who are lifeguards, and they said, you know what's really interesting about the way we've been trained is that when someone's out and they're floundering and they actually need help and we go out to them, we don't step in. We don't come up close to them right away. And the reason is because they're going to take us down with them. We wait until they're ready for us to help them, which means that they'll just kind of float, holding on to their can. And the person's like, ah! And we're like, all right, just tell me when you're ready. I'm ready. No, just tell me when you're ready. And then as soon as they're ready, they'll reach out. Then they'll hand them the can, and then they'll bring them in safely. And I think that's the way God has to work in us sometimes, because we think we want rescue, but we're not really ready. <laughs> God's like, it's okay, I'm here. I'm just waiting for you to raise your hand, and then I'll step into the story. And see, God can only invite us into his rescue, and this is why Jesus is so great, because he is God's invitation into rescue. It's the song we sang this morning as we started off. Was singing this great hope of God loved us, this world, so much he gave us his son that anyone who would believe in him wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. And that's God's rescue and invitation. So God wanted to do something through Jonah because his heart is always for the lost and the broken. And he's always wanting to invite us into something new with him, every single one of us. But more than just doing something through Jonah, God wanted to do something in Jonah. Because guess who else was lost and broken too? It wasn't just the Ninevites. It was Jonah. I mean, he wanted to do something inside of Jonah because brokenness has many faces. It doesn't always look the same. It's always easier to see it in someone else and point the finger at them, right? But there's stuff going on in our story too. And, and we didn't fully understand the reason Jonah ran in chapter 1. We just thought, like, oh, that's an awkward assignment. No way, or... It wasn't something that he wanted to do, but what we find out is, no, his heart was messed up. He wanted to see 120,000 people wiped out. There's some pain in that moment. There's some hurt. There's some bitterness. And I think what God's wanting to do is, Jonah, just as much as I want to deliver them, I want to deliver you too. And this was a chance for you to find something better than whatever's going on in your story, that you're so stuck in pain in that place. He was completely bound up in his bitterness, and it caused him to run and stomp off and wallow on the outskirts instead of joining in the party of celebration. And bitterness will isolate you. One of the, the greatest portrayals I've ever seen of bitterness was in the film Les Miserables. I don't know if you read the book or watched the movie or listened to the songs. You're cool if you do. <laughs> but Inspector Javert, if I said his name right, help me, literature majors. Javert, there we go. 
This is the guy that was pursuing the main character, Jean Valjean, who had found grace in his story and was transformed in his story, but he was still a criminal being pursued by this inspector. And near the end of this great chase that was happening for decades, Gervert finds him and Jean Valjean saves his life, and Gervert doesn't know what to do with this kindness and mercy because it doesn't fit his framework. And look at the response in the, the musical version, Gervert's final song. He says this, And my thoughts fly apart. Can this man be believed? Shall his sins be forgiven? Shall his crimes be reprieved? And must I now begin to doubt? Who never doubted all these years? My heart is stone, and still it trembles. The world I have known is lost in shadow. Is he from heaven or from hell? And does he know that granting me my life today, this man has killed me even so? I'm reaching, but I fall, and the stars are black and cold as I stare into the, world, into the void of a world that cannot hold. I'll escape now from this world, from the world of Jean Valjean. There is nowhere I can turn. There is no way to go on. And if you know how the story ends, at least in the musical version, he ends his life because he doesn't know how to reconcile mercy and grace with his own bitterness. And bitterness is ugly. And if we're not careful, it can own us. It can destroy us. It can eat us from the inside out. And it can cause us to miss out on the incredible things that God is doing all around us. To miss out on the the beautiful thing that God has that he actually wants to do through us in the lives of the people he wants to lead us into relationship with. And the beautiful things that God wants to actually do in us because he wants to change our story too for the better and for the good. If we'll let him, if we'll let him meet us. And, and I love that God didn't want Jonah to miss out, miss out. He didn't want him to miss this, which is why he messed with him. Jonah, wake up, man. There's something going on. Jonah, your heart's out of whack. You're not seeing things clearly. And what God was trying to help him understand is that this bitterness can reveal some things inside that, that are some of those deep places where I think God might actually want to move in close to do a work in us. Because if we're willing to listen, I think our bitterness might actually show us some things where God could help us. See, I think it's very likely that God wants to mess with you today. Because he loves you. So what's the plant that got withered up? What's the worm eaten into your story today? Or maybe God's wanting to show you something, not because he wants to mess with you for your harm, but he wants to wake you up to something going on in your heart. See, that's where God wants to meet you, to free you, to lead you into something good. And God always will use a plant and worm scenario to stir something in you. Like every time I go into traffic or a parking lot, something stirs up in me. <laughs> and I realize, yeah, I need help. <laughs> and what do you do when they get your promotion and you know they don't deserve it? What does that stir up in you? Or what happens when they don't get something that you, they get something you know they don't deserve and you didn't get it? Man, what does that stir up in you? What about when they are living life and they're happy and they walked out on you? They abandoned you. They wronged you. They hurt you. And every time you see their smiling mug on Instagram, you want to figure out how to blow up the internet. I mean, what stirs up in you then? Because maybe, just maybe, that's exactly where God wants to meet you. Because he wants to lead you into something better. And those, those plants, those worms, those moments surface things in us. And our bitterness reveals some conditions of our heart that, that I think maybe we should pay attention to. Because God is good and wants to bring us into something better than what that stuff is. God's plan for your life, God's hope for your life isn't that you'd sit on the outskirts in misery. It's that you would wake up to his love and join in the celebration of what he wants to do in this world. And I think that's an incredible gift that he leads us. And so maybe, maybe sometimes our bitterness can reveal some things. I mean, sometimes my bitterness, you know what it reveals about me? A sense of entitlement. 
because I have a strong sense of, but I deserve it. And when it doesn't go my way, it doesn't take very much for me to start spinning, and I can get very angry with God because he didn't sign off on my plans. He didn't sign off on what I wanted. And it's not, it doesn't take very much for me to get spun. Ask Christy. She'll tell you. Joel spins fairly quickly when it doesn't go his way, and there's stuff in my heart that's being revealed in that moment. And, and you know what? When, when I think about when I first met Jesus, you know what Jesus didn't say to me in that moment? Joel, can I follow you? He, he did not say that. Like, Joel, your life looks so incredible. Can I be a follower of you? And that's not how it worked. When Jesus showed up in my story, he said, bro, you're a mess. But I love you. And I have paid the price of your freedom. Walk with me. It's really hard to have a sense of entitlement when you realize the tab has been paid in full by someone else. You know what else bitterness can reveal? Sometimes bitterness can reveal some of our deepest hurts. If it's too personal for you right now, think about the person sitting next to you or near you. But have you ever known someone who was just so bound up in in bitterness and it just seemed like they hurt everyone around them? You know why? They've been hurt. There's pain in that story. Man, if that is you, listen, I get it. I do, because I limp in areas of my life where I have been wronged, where I have been hurt. And if I'm not careful, it's so easy to just wallow in my bitterness like a blanket, thinking that it's comfortable, but really all it does is isolate me, just like Jonah. And it moves me away from relationship and away from God and away from healing if I choose to let it and And I think that's one of the reasons why Jesus invites us into this incredibly beautiful, incredibly difficult thing called forgiveness. He invites us to offer the forgiveness that he's already given us. Because forgiveness is always about freedom. Freedom from being bound up by the hurt and the pain and the bitterness of life that can own us. And yet bitterness, if we're not careful, it will not allow us to join in the celebration. It will not allow us to experience what forgiveness and freedom can look like because it won't let us get over our hurts. And what we'll say is, no way. They don't deserve it. Not after what they did. But we do, right? We always deserve it. At least I think I do, especially if I'm the one who's done the hurting, then obviously I deserve some grace and mercy. Come on, I was having a bad day. Come on, you play the same game. Don't look at me like that. (laughs) And yet, friends, I don't think we want to play the deserve game. I'm really not sure I want what I actually deserve. I would much rather take this grace train because I would much rather have what God wants to give me because of his goodness and his love for me because that's something that will change me if we let him. And let me tell you, God has something better for us than the misery and bitterness that we sometimes hold on to. God has mercy and love and compassion and kindness and goodness that he wants to give us and lead us into. And if we will let him, it will free us and change us. Change us into the people we long to be in the core of who we are. So what if? And what if we could take a step into more of that life today? What if we could let God lead us into the life we are created for? What if we could let God lead us to be more like him, to sink our hearts with him? Because that's his desire for Jonah. Jonah, you know me. You know me. So why is your heart so far from me? Oh, Jonah, you're missing it. You're missing everything that I'm wanting to do, not just through you, but what I want to do in you. If you will but let me lead you and show you how to love like you are loved. And see, the story ends unresolved because it forces us to think about ourselves. And how will we respond? 
So what if? What if we could step into that thing God wants to do through us and that thing God wants to do in us? Like, like what, what if we could actually step away from bitterness? Well, what if we could step out of our entitlement and, and out of our hurt into freedom and healing today? Like, what, what if we could actually let God lead us and our heart would begin to beat in rhythm with his, that we could begin to sync up with God and we could learn to love like we've been loved and we could love each other that way. We could love our, our neighbors. We could love the people with those bumper stickers. We could love even our enemies. Because that's how God has loved us. What if we could learn to love like him so that through us, they could experience his love? Man, it's not easy. Which is why I'm so grateful Jesus is a part of the story. Because Jesus invites us to walk with him. So he can teach us how to love like him. So he can put his spirit in us to change us from the inside out. So we can become people like him. And listen to this invitation Jesus gives. This life he invites us into to step into this life so we can move with him as he sinks our hearts with his and with God. Listen to what he says here in John 15. He says, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. And those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. That's not a mean statement. That's an invitation. If I I can't do it without you, What happens if I actually walk with you? What then am I capable of? It's almost as if there's this song that we can hear that we want to be able to sing, but we can't always sync up with it. Have you ever had a song just caught in your head and you can't shake it? I love that. It's It's like there's this melody that was put inside of me. Don't get excited. I'm not actually going to play a song. Right? But listen, listen, when it's all good. Oh, and I I know like three chords because I was trying to be cool in high school. Oh, see, that wasn't it. There it is. Oh, and then you could do. And when it's going well, it's like there's this, this song inside of us that just wants to get out. And then they show up. They walk into your story and they they hurt you bad <laughs> then they win the lottery <laughs> and then suddenly it doesn't sound so good doesn't feel good but man there's something in you that just want you want to play the song still because you know it's better when you can play the song you know it's better when your heart's in sync but there's this dissonance in your soul and you can't fix it which is why Jesus is so amazing because when Jesus shows up Jesus doesn't complain about the song you're singing. He's like, that sounds almost good. Try it like this. And we just let him move in and we give him our heart. And he just begins to change some things. 
and he begins to tune some things. And he begins to stir some things. And he begins to heal some things. And he begins to speak and guide and lead. And we just take some steps with him. And something begins to happen inside of us. It's like that song that's always been there, but we just can't seem to get right. He begins to lead us into it again. And there's this new freedom we find. And man, it has nothing to do with how good I am. It has everything to do with how good he is and what he wants to do in my story your story. Do you want to sing that song again? Then raise your hand and say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I want to move into chapter 5 where I get to join in the party. Where I get to go into Nineveh and celebrate this change you're doing in the lives of my city and my family and my friends and my neighbors because you're doing it in me too. And it is well with my soul because you are in my story. So God, we thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, for your kindness, for your love. We thank you that that never changes even though we can. And because that never changes, we can change again. And so show up in our story. We raise our hand and say we need you and thank you that you grab hold of us and lift us into new things. And so God, would we as, as, a, as a church, as a people, would we desire what you desire? And when we're out of whack and out of sorts with you, would we say, here we are, tune our hearts, let us be in sync with you because you want to do something in us so that you can do something through us. Oh, we love you. And we thank you, and we praise you, and we say have your way, because we trust you. Amen. All right, thank you. And a big round of applause for Jeff, who played Jesus. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs>